All right, so we are in the heart of Appalachia right now. It's very cold. We're a lot, lot higher elevated than Hotlanta. And um, we're about to go on a trail, a very desolate trail called Raven Rock that's here in, in the Clayton, Georgia area, kind of bordering South Carolina. Actually, those mountains right over there, if you can see through the trees, are South Carolina. And just like we've talked about on this series in Appalachia, you'll find many, many, many old cemeteries that seem to have been forgotten about. And there is a family cemetery that we're going to go to first and investigate before we head down the trail. If you hear something in the woods, no, you didn't. No, you didn't. Keep walking. You do not want to be outside when the sun goes down. We're usually hunted for a long time by these creatures. It details their experience with the mountain people. It's feral, rumored to be cannibalistic men that lived in East Tennessee in the woods. Generations of people who have like grown up living in these like caves. Before we get into the video today, I just want to give a quick shout out to one of our sponsors, Gnostic TV. Gnostic TV is ancient wisdom reimagined. This is a Netflix for those who are spiritually curious and want a place to go where there is no censorship. I personally am doing a whole series on Gnostic TV called The Esoteric Explorer, where I am providing exclusive content to Gnostic. Gnostic TV is a host to all sorts of different content creators, many of whom are your old favorites. If you would like to check out Gnostic TV, there is a link down in the description box below. At the end of 2023, I released a last minute video about this concept of feral people. I was doing some research into another story when I ran across this horrifying legend and folklore that exists in the southern part of the Appalachian mountain chain. Now, as most of you know, I live at the southern tip of the Appalachian mountain chain, and I had never heard of feral people before. And the idea of, of these people living, these cannibalistic people living just up the road from me horrified me. Now, obviously, given the content of my channel, I'm not a stranger to the weird, the wacky, the woo-woo. I very much am a believer in the weird and the wacky and the woo-woo. I'm, I'm very much a believer in the idea that we are spiritual beings having a very human experience. I absolutely believe in things like Bigfoot or the Chupacabra. I've seen my fair share of ghosts. I believe in things like portals and alien interaction with humans. But the story of feral people rocked me to my core. The stories of feral people scared me more than anything else in this world has ever scared me before. You see, I'm a smart girl. I, I, I think I'm rather intelligent. <laughs> and part of being smart means knowing where you're stupid. And I have said many times before, even before I learned about feral people, that I don't ever want to go off trail in Appalachia. For uh, I just know that the Appalachian mountains are as beautiful as they are. They can be deadly. After all, Many, many, many people go missing every single year on Appalachia. I recently learned that the Appalachian Trail of the East Coast is technically shorter than the Pacific Crest Trail. However, due to the terrain of Appalachia, it does tend to take people longer to do the Appalachian Trail than its counterpart over on the West Coast. Seeing that I have also lived on the West Coast, I truly believe that it is because Appalachia is a whole lot harder to hike than anything out west. I've also had the luxury in my life to have traveled the world multiple times and to have lived in many different countries and continents, including Africa. And still to this day, I firmly stand by my opinion that the Appalachian Mountains are some of the most wild and harrowing mountains left on the planet. 
Things just happen in Appalachia. Man versus nature, nature is always going to win. But with its beauty, there also seems to be something sinister within Appalachia Mountain. After all, the Appalachian Mountains are the absolute oldest mountain chain in the world. We know this because of their rolling hills. You see, when mountains are new, they have ridges, kind of like the Rocky Mountains. They're very sharp. But as they get old, they tend to roll more. Now, just because I believe there's something very sinister within the Appalachian Mountains doesn't mean I don't love the Appalachian Mountains. Again, I find the Appalachia to be one of the most beautiful places on this planet. The view from Appalachia is breathtaking. There are colors that come from Appalachia that you don't see anywhere else in the world. But once again, go too deep in the forest and the forest will swallow you whole. Now, recently I was up in the Appalachian Mountains. I'm working on a series over on Gnostic TV called the Esoteric Explorer series, where we are covering a lot of cases from Appalachia. I've covered the Moon-Eyed People, I've covered the Bell Witch, and just recently I went back up to Appalachia because occasionally when you're in southern Appalachia, when you're hiking, you will, you will stumble upon random deserted family cemeteries. And there's a particular cemetery that I knew about up by a trail that not many people know about in Clayton, Georgia, a trail where they specifically shot some of the scenes from the movie Deliverance. Now, something very peculiar about this cemetery that I found was that even though it's abandoned, there's obviously somebody going that still takes care of the cemetery. Things are left at the cemetery that are new, like flags, and you, you can see that somebody is there cleaning at least three of the tombstones. The rest of the tombstones, you can't even read them anymore because of the decay of time. Now, again, this particular trail where they shot some of the scenes from Deliverance, this trail that I hike a lot, does lead down to the Chattahoochee River. The reason why I hike this trail a lot is because a lot of times in the summertime, we'll go up there and we'll hike down to the river and spend the day basically on the beach down there swimming. And, and it's nice because, again, this trail is pretty secluded. There's not many people. Only in the years that I've been going up to this trail, I only, I've only ever seen another person one time. So we get a bit of a privacy being up there with our dog. We can let our dog off leash. We can swim and hang out. The trail itself is pretty tough to hike. It's a very steep trail, and I still can't decide if going down is harder or coming back up is harder, because when you are going down, down the trail, you do tend to need a hiking stick. Otherwise, you run the risk of sliding, actually sliding down the trail. Now, with that being said, sometimes we go long periods of time before going up there, and when we went up there a couple of weeks ago for me to get some pictures and some footage of the cemetery, we decided that we would make it kind of a work trip, a work weekend getaway trip. I was going to do some work while I was up there getting footage for my series on Gnostic TV, and we were also going to take advantage of the opportunity to hike. We got a hotel room up in Clayton, and we spent time hiking. Of course, the first trail we hit was this particular trail by the cemetery. And even though this was the dead of winter, so it was very, very cold, we decided we would go down to the beach anyway. And at least we would just spend a couple hours sitting there looking at the view, taking in nature. Now, this happens quite periodically where we will take this trail either in winter or in summertime. And we can tell that nobody has been there in a really long time. Usually, if you're familiar with trails, especially trails in national parks, after all, this is considered to be part of a national park, you'll have a park ranger that will come and keep up the trail every now and again, cleaning off the path. For example, whenever trees fall, you will see where a park ranger has come and chainsawed the tree out of the way to make room for the hikers. You will also see where they've taken away debris, sticker bushes that have fallen, to again make way for the hikers. And so when somebody hasn't been up there for a while, the trail is very, very hard to hike because there are fallen trees. There is a lot of debris. So when we started going down the mountain, we, we were pretty aware that 
probably no one had been out there recently. After all, this is the dead of winter and Clayton, Georgia is really high up in Appalachia. So it's a lot colder up there than it ever is down here in the city of Atlanta. So we figured that they probably had not been up there because most of the time people taking these trails are probably going to frequent them more when the weather is better. We started down the trail and of course we could see right away there were fallen trees, there was overgrowth, it was really slippery with all of the leaves on the ground. Absolutely, it, ha it looked like it had been months since anybody had been out there to cut the passageway. So that makes what I found at the base of the trail even more freaky to me. And at the end of this video, I'm gonna show you guys that footage. Something was left on the beach that was obviously left by a human being, something with a literal consciousness to create this shape. When again, it was obvious that no one had been on those trails for a very long time. And the thing that was left, it if it had been left there months ago, would have been washed away by now. So it was obviously left pretty recently, maybe a day to a few hours before we actually got down there. And it got me thinking about feral people. It could have been a Bigfoot. It could have been, there's a possibility, it could have been a canoeer coming down from a different angle. But the truth is, what was left on this beach was not put there by anybody that came down the trail we came down. Again, unless it was a feral person. We know from reports that feral people know how to go through the trees. They know how to go through the mountains off the beaten path. They've, they've been trained to go through the mountains that way. That's, that's their home. That's their territory. They don't come from civilization like we do. They wouldn't need to take particular man-made trails like we do. But before we get to that, let me get into a little bit more of my research into who these feral people are. Now, once again, I will place my previous video down in the description box below when I was totally shocked and had just stumbled upon this research. But I want to make it very, very, very clear that feral people are not what we refer to as hillbillies or rednecks or mountain folk. Hillbillies, rednecks, mountain folk, those are people that exist within the ecosystem of modern civilization. Even though they might be extremely poor, even though they might have outhouses still and no electricity, they are still coming from a civilization that resembles our own. They speak the same languages that we do. They build shelters in the same way that we do. They are not feral people. Now, within my research into Appalachian Mountains, I heard a very interesting story that I thought had some merit to it. Now, if you've been on this channel for a while, you know that we're really working with two theories when it comes to, especially to the American continent. We have the official narrative. Everybody knows the official narrative that this continent was discovered in 1492 by Columbus. We all had to learn that little rhyme, that nursery rhyme when we were kids. In 1492, Columbus sailed the ocean blue. And when Columbus got here, he thought he had found India, India, like the actual country, India. And that's why he called the Native Americans Indians. At this point, we are taught that the Native Americans had never seen white people before. And after Christopher Columbus's discovery of the American continent, that's when all these European settlers and explorers started to come over and colonize this continent. We know from that story that for Appa the Appalachian mountain chain, that was the boundary for a very long time. Hence why the original 13 colonies from the American flag, the 13 stripes, are all on the east coast of the United States. It took a while before the quote unquote settlers, colonists, were able to even try to go over the Appalachian Mountains to go beyond the Appalachian Mountains. Now, we also know that even in that official narrative, there are some inconsistencies. For example, we do know that the Vikings came over to this continent a very long time ago and settled Newfoundland. And as I covered on my Moon Eyed People ser uh, episode over on Gnostic TV, I spoke about all sorts of historical references to European people coming over to the American continent long before 1492 
and setting up actual communities, creating what we called white tribes of Native Americans. We also know from the official narrative that were taught in schools that there were black tribes that had come over from Africa that's, and settled here in the Americas. We also know that there are a lot of artifacts here, especially on the East Coast of the United States of America, that disprove the official narrative. For example, there are countless ISIS temples that have been drowned out by these these dams and fake lakes. We also know that people find Egyptian artifacts in their backyards on the East Coast all the time. Like how the hell did Egyptian money get here? Lots of it. Lots of Egyptian money. So even when we're looking at the official narrative, we're already hitting road bumps and obstacles that challenge the official narrative of Christopher Columbus. Hence why in a lot of national parks, you're not allowed to go a lot of places. And hence why in some places, they make it illegal for you to actually start digging in your own backyard because they don't want you to find some of these artifacts. The other narrative, however, which would support all these things found, these artifacts that have legitimately been found, is the narrative of Tartaria, something that we have covered on this channel off and on. I'm not a Tartarian channel. I'm not a Tartarian expert. There are a lot of channels out there that are specifically designed to look at this, this new evidence coming out. But just briefly, for those that are new to this, this theory, this timeline, is that nothing we've been taught about our future is actually accurate. And that Tartaria is what existed before like the mid 1800s. And then in the mid 1800s, there was a huge mud flood that reset everything. The Tartarian evidence also points to this idea of a different map and that the geographical locations of a lot of these cultures and communities that we've been taught in the official narrative aren't where they say they are. For example, with the Tartarian map, we're looking at the real Egypt being in the southeastern United States, with the Mississippi Re River actually being the Nile, which makes sense because if we look at a lot of the photographs from the restart after the mud floods when cameras were quote unquote first invented, we see pictures of great big sphinx and pyramids in Memphis, Tennessee. This also makes me wonder if that is why Appalachia has a bit of a spooky feeling to it. Because there's obviously a lot of truths that are hidden within these mountains. And sometimes what we don't know can scare us. Or at least sometimes when we think we know something and then we're shown evidence that what we've been taught or we think we know is wrong, it can also create a huge amount of cognitive dissonance and fear. Now, I often like to say that two things get to be true, but in this situation, two things don't get to be true. The official narrative cannot be true if Tartaria is true. And likewise, if Tartaria is true, the official narrative can't be true. In this situation, both cannot coexist. But with that being said, for me, as a human being, as someone who's just trying to figure out what the truth is in our world, I'm comfortable at this point acknowledging both timelines. Since I don't know which one is actually true, I will keep myself informed on both. At some point during the early 20th century, they started to log. They created these logging roads throughout Appalachia. This information that I just found out does explain mountain people, but it doesn't explain feral people. This information that I found out can coexist with both the timelines because the origin point of this happened would, would have happened after the quote unquote mud floods. Apparently at one point in Appalachia, there were huge, huge, ginormous trees. We've all seen a lot of references to these trees that also point to the fact that there were giants here on this world, all over the world at some point with gigantic plant life where little tiny ants compared to the size of, of, of these things. And during the, the um, early 20th century, late 19th century, early 20th century, when there was a lot of settlement happening again in Appalachia, they had what they called logging roads. 
these were for loggers, okay? Who are loggers? These are people that go into the mountain and cut down trees for us to use for either warmth, for fires, for building, whatnot. And during this time, the loggers started to specifically, on command, chop down a bunch of the really old big trees. Those were the first trees to go. Makes sense, right? Bird, it kills two birds with one stone, right? Like you can take down a big tree that's got a lot of wood for us little people over here, the non-giants to use to build houses and create fires with, but it also gets rid of the evidence that something is off from what they teach us in this official narrative over here. Well, once these logging companies started, it was a great employment opportunity, just kind of like mining became a great employment opportunity. So a lot of people moved into Appalachia at this time to start to work for the logging companies. Over time, these logging companies started to dwindle out of business. This kind of came around the time the railroads were being built through Appalachia. And once these logging companies came out of business, they basically told the people working for them in Appal that came to Appalachia to work for them, like, oh, shucks, we're out of business. Now you're just going to have to figure out how to get back home. Well, a lot of these people that were working for the logging companies did not have the money or the means to get back to the East Coast, back to their original homes. We're talking about a time when people were in wagons and horseback. And so they basically were stuck living in Appalachia. Now, again, it's, it, it's not as easy as just hitching a ride. We're talking about terrain that is so freaking difficult to climb that they were probably even safer just staying where they were. And this started this the, these generations of what we call mountain people, the hillbillies of Appalachia, although I feel like hillbilly is a pretty derogatory term. You guys know what I'm talking about. Very poor, very poverty-stricken people who, again, a lot of times, even today in 2024, don't have indoor plumbing, don't have electricity. But these people, once again, the big difference from them and the feral people is that they come from the ecosystem that we come from. They understand poverty. Poverty. They understand being poor. They know they know they're poor. They know they're stuck on the mountain. And yes, sometimes there have has been inbreeding, which I don't necessarily fault them for that, because to travel around and meet other people at some points became nearly impossible. Even though inbreeding is not good and does should never be done, we also have to have empathy and understand they were kind of just left out there to survive. Now, with that being said, the, the mountain people, the people who have been stuck in Appalachia for all these generations, definitely, definitely, I believe, identify with Appalachia as being their home. And once again, mountain people are very different from people who live in Appalachia. It's a very different kind of breed of human. I think most Americans from this area know what I'm speaking of. If you live in a town in Appalachia, it's very different than living off of these dirt roads alone, off of the grid in society where, again, you're having to go pump your own water because you don't have indoor plumbing every single day. But nonetheless, they come from the same origin point that we all come from. Feral people, however, are different. Feral people, from our perspective, would be considered Poor because they don't live in the matrix that we live in. And even the mountain people themselves, the quote unquote hillbillies, live in the sense of our own matrix system where they are considered to be in poverty again. But the feral people, even though they don't have money, they're not in the same template of life that we live in. They don't have indoor plumbing, they don't have electricity, but that's not something that they necessarily want. Because this breed of person, this type of human, has lived in and out of the mountains and in and out of the caves for longer than any of us know. A lot of people, as I said in my original video, believe that these feral people came from people who ran away from the Civil War. I don't think so. First of all, if you were dodging the Civil War, yeah, for us that happened a long time ago, but historically speaking, it wasn't that long ago you would eventually want to come back to civilization. You would be able to teach your children a language, whether that be English or French or whatever it is they spoke, What, depending on what pocket of the country they were in at that time, whatever language they spoke, they would continue to speak that language to their children, even if they were hiding out in the woods. They would continue to teach their children 
things like addition and subtraction, how to read while they're waiting out in the woods, because I would, I would imagine that they would eventually migrate back to society. However, the feral people, from what I understand, don't have a language, not a language we know anyway. It's not a recognizable language as far as we're concerned. In fact, they seem to only speak in grunts and like ticks. Okay. We also know that the Native Americans of this area, more specifically the Cherokee, warned settlers about the feral people. So how would these people be runners from the Civil War if the Native Americans were already aware of their existence? We also know that these feral people are very animalistic in the sense that they can run barefoot through the sticky bushes, the briars, the thorns of Appalachia. If I were to do that, or if you were to do that, we would come out with bruises and scratches and probably a broken ankle. But they're able to do it. They're able to claw their way up trees without being seen or heard, like a squirrel. They're able to hunt you and stalk you and follow you without you even being aware that they're there. These are humans that have learned to survive in some of the harshest elements of nature. And with that, they have learned to take on survival skill, skills of an animal. Feral people are also notoriously cannibalistic. They literally hunt us. Now, there's no evidence that they eat themselves. So part of me wonders, do they not know that we're the same species as them? Do we look so different from them because we're we have hygiene, we, we're clean, we wear makeup, we brush our hair, our clothing is different. We don't look like we've lived out in the wild. Do they not realize that we're the same as them? Now, it does seem that the feral people will leave you alone if you stay on trail. People who hike Appalachia that stay on trail tend to not have issues with feral people, but those that go off trail, those are the ones that that the ones that live to tell about it come back with stories. Now, something very interesting I also learned about the Appalachian Mountains, something in my 40 years I'd never heard before. So if you've heard of this, please comment down in the comment section below and enlighten us because I thought this was absolutely wild. Apparently, in the Appalachian, there are animal species that are only found in Appalachia. Sometimes an, a particular animal species will only be found on certain summits in Appalachia. And apparently some of these species we've never seen before because we can't get to that summit by foot. So the only people going to these particular summits are on helicopters and since this is all national forest it's people who are approved to be up there gives a little bit more credence to the bigfoot stories doesn't it so with that being said we're gonna end this video watching my video clip that i took in our last trip up to appalachia now once again i'm going to remind you that no one had been there to clear the trail in what looked like months. And the only other way to that beach besides the trail that we came down is to come from the other side. The other side of the river is the border of South Carolina. And it's very steep rock on the other side. We don't ever see people on the other side. There's really no way if you're coming from South Carolina to, to hike down that summit. So how did this little rock formation get there? So this was just kind of left here. We discovered it like this. What do you guys think? You think feral people did that? <laughs> 